Okay, in this video segment, we're going to start talking about uh, this idea of decay and how long it actually takes for things to decompose and to break down. And we're going to be focusing on basically half-lives and how we do ca calculations on those different half-lives. Okay, So we talked about in the last video segment that these different radioisotopes decay, either alpha, beta, gamma decay. There are other types of decay that aren't as common, but for this short unit, we're going to focus on the three most common ways that it happens. So when they do decay, if you take a look, this is uranium-238. It's going to undergo alpha decay, then beta, beta, alpha, 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 beta, beta, alpha, beta, beta, alpha. So it continually goes down in these multi-stage decays, and it turns into different elements or different radioisotopes as it go until it gets to lead-206, which is finally a stable version of uh, what originally was uranium-238. Now if you take a look, we see our half-lives here. So a half-life is basically the time it takes for half of the radioactive isotope to turn into something else. Okay, We don't know which particles turn. We don't know why they turn. We just know that that's the timeline it takes for half of them to decompose or decay into something else. Okay, um, We can't actually pinpoint which ones will decay. That's this knowledge we don't have yet. Okay, So for example, uranium-238 it's going to take 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years for half of any sample to turn into thorium-234. That's the first step of its decay. After 24.5 days, anything that gets created, half of that, will then turn into protactinium-234, which then, 1.14 minutes later, something it decays again also. Okay, So if you can imagine, this becomes a very complex kind of graphical or kind of complex system because if you have some of these decayed, they're going to start decaying right away into this, which then they'll start decaying into that and so forth and so on. Okay, um, The reality is the whole system is limited by your longest decay, which is the uranium-238 times 10 to the ninth year. So all of these things here are really actually pretty fast in comparison to that first step to go down to thorium. So that's going to kind of limit that whole decay cycle there, or that whole decay system. Now when we talk about half-lives, um, we basically are looking at, again, the time it takes for half of them to decay. Okay, It can be anything from picoseconds up to billions upon billions of years for these things to happen. So here's just some example half-lives uh, that we have. So for example, tritium, hydrogen with three, a mass number three, takes 12 years about, okay? Um, sulfur 35, 88 days, okay? Iodine 131, um, which is something that if you remember from the Japan uh, disaster, the nuclear disaster there, that was in the news a lot, iodine 131, um, because iodine-131 would have been one of the airborne radioisotopes that would be ejected from a, a boiling down or a breaking down a nuclear reactor. So this one takes about eight days for it to decay. Okay, um, We have days, hours, seconds, years. Um, here we get 1.64 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds, so we're talking less than a millisecond. And if you look up others, they're down to picoseconds. Okay. Um, and for these systems. So it really is dependent on the individual isotopes in terms of their timelines and what they have and how stable they are in terms of when they're going to decay. When you start to graph half-lives, uh, you see a very common looking graph that kind of shows up if we go down half-life by half-life. Okay, So bismuth-210 has a half-life of five days. So it undergoes alpha decay to become thallium-206. So if you look, at day zero you have 100 percent, in this case 100 grams, a bismuth. After five days, you have 50. After 10 days, 25. After 15 days, 12.5. Then 6.25. Then 3.125. Okay. So if we start to graph this, we see this nice curving line that kind of comes down. It looks like it's going to come down and hit the line, but it never actually does. Okay. So we see this nice exponential decay here. Okay. If you've done rate law stuff in math class, this is a first order rate law or a first order uh, graphic in terms of our decay. And what it's showing us is that every five years, half of them are gone. Okay? One of the big misconceptions of people who don't study this or don't have a good grasp on this, they think that if half of the half-life is five days, after 10 days, it will be all gone. Okay? So that's not the case. After five days, half of it's gone. Okay? After five more days, half of that is now gone. After five more days, half of that is gone. 
Okay, so it's kind of like going to the store, and if you have a 50% off sale and they give you 50% of 50%, it's not free. Okay, so if you get 50% off of 50%, you're actually paying 25% for uh, that uh, purchase, whatever you're making at the store. Okay, now if we take a look, we can jump to this little half life generator from this Colorado website, and we have beryllium 11, okay? And I like this graphic because it kind of shows you here is all your different uh, beryllium 11s in yellow, and they're going to turn into boron 11 instead, okay? Now, it has a half-life of 13.8 seconds. So after 13.8 seconds, half of these should be blue. So if I just start it, we see that slowly they start turning into blue, or I should say quickly they start turning into blue, and... After this whole 13.81 seconds, half of them are blue and half of them are yellow, okay? But because now less of them are there to turn, only half of them again will turn over in the next 13.81 seconds. Now over time, what you see if we graph this is that the amount of yellow, its change slows down and the change for the blue also slows down. And if you look, we see more and more of them disappearing. Eventually, even with half-lives, eventually you come down to only having one atom left or one isotope left. When that very last atom is left, it really is undeterminate how long that atom will hold out before it's going to decay because the half-life equation no longer applies. Okay, So when you get down to that very last atom, it may never decay or it may decay instantly, and it can be anywhere between those two things, being zero time to infinite amount of time between those two things. Okay, If you take a look... In this case, we're still slowly losing these guys as we keep going down and down and down and down. Okay, um, We're going to restart this thing. And instead of doing beryllium, we're going to do nitrogen 17, which has a half-life of only 4 seconds. Okay, So I'm going to challenge you, pick one of the yellows and watch it. And let's see, how long does yours hold out? Mine's already gone. I already lost it. So I tried. Pick another one. Yeah, it's gone too. So in this case, because the half-life is so much faster, this decay happens so much quicker in the process. Okay, But the same graph developed, the curves just are more steep at the beginning, and they still flatline as they did before. Okay, Now we talked a little bit about um, multiple decay chains. Okay? So if I go down to the end and look at oxygen 21, they show a two-step decay, where first it decays into fluorine, but fluorine has a half-life also, and that decays into neon, which has a half-life. Okay, so we're going to see two different decays running simultaneously here, all starting with fluorine 21. So fluorine is going to decay, turn into, um, sorry, oxygen is going to decay, turn into fluorine. Fluorine is going to decay and turn into neon. So you can kind of see how when, when, when there's multiple steps, how that would look graphically. So initially we see all the yellow disappearing, a whole bunch of blue starting, and then the green starts to come on too, and at some point, the blue reaches its peak, and then it starts to decay down because it's all turning back into the green, into our thing. So yeah, over time, eventually, all the yellow will be gone, and then all the blue will also disappear over our timeline as we, do, as we see this kind of coming down. And then they'll all eventually turn into green. Now, if you look, we have some yellow left. We have some blue left in here. Now all the yellow is finally gone, and our blue are still kind of holding on here. Okay, And we're down to three, we're down to two, we're down to one, and this could go at any time. We don't know for sure when it's going to happen, but at some point it disappears, and there we saw it actually disappear on us. Okay, So that's kind of the idea behind half-lives. Now what we can do is we actually can calculate a half-life using the equation. Because okay. it's not really useful if we can only determine things every half of a life. You know, For example, carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 plus years. So if all we could get data on for carbon-14 would be either 0 years or 5,000 or 10,000 years, it's not very useful for us. So we have to be able to calculate those times or those amounts between those different half-lives. To do that, we have this equation. Okay. So some symbolism you may not, not have seen before. We have A equaling A sub naught times one half little t over big T. Okay. So here's what they mean. A is the amount of substance left. Okay. 
So make sure that you circle this bold italicize that. That's how much of your substance you have left. It could be a percentage, it can be grams, it can be milliliters, it can actually be measured in curies or uh, what they call vehicles. There's all sorts of different ways to measure radioactivity, um, but that's how much you have left. Okay? A sub naught, this little naught symbol down here, now tells you that's the original amount. Okay? So this is how much that you started with. Again, if you don't if you have percentages, this is just a hundred percent. If you have um, milliliters or grams, it's just however much you started with within your substance. Okay? Little t is how much time you've spent. Okay? Make sure that you have that in the same unit as the half-life. Okay? Big T is the half-life. So the way I remember it is that the important number, the one number that's a big kind of deal is the half-life here. So that's why that's the capital T. The little t is what's going on in this one particular instance of it. So it's the smaller of the two of the two uh, T's. So the big T is your half-life, the little T is your elapsed time. Okay. Written this way, it's very easy for us to solve for A, um, how much we have left, or for how much we started with. Because we can put the T's into the exponent here and solve for either A or A sub zero pretty easily with, the, with this equation. Okay. So let's take a look at our practice problem. Iodine 131 has a half-life of eight days. How many grams will be remaining of an 80 gram sample after three weeks of decay? Okay, so we know the half life is eight, so that's going to be our big T. We want to know the grams remaining of an 80 gram sample. So 80 grams are starting point, so that's our A sub zero. Okay, after three weeks of decay, so we have three weeks. Okay, three weeks is not the same as days, so we got to convert that into days. So there's seven days to a week. Seven times three is 21. So we have 21 days of decay. Okay, so it's a half-life of eight days. So after eight days, we'd be at 40 grams. After 16 days, we'd be at 20 grams. Okay, after 24 days, we'd be at 10 grams. So in theory, our answer should be somewhere between 20 and 10 grams if we do our math right. Okay, so you can kind of do a little mental math to start this. So if we plug those numbers in, if we take a look, um, here's our 80 grams, our one half. We have our 21 days of decay. Our half life was eight, and we get 13 grams left over. Okay, uh, round it off to three significant figures. Okay? Now, the hard part is what happens if we don't know little t or big t. Okay, so if we have a different scenario, in this case, what is the half life of the radioisotope oxygen 15? if 500 grams is reduced to 16.63 grams in 600 seconds or 10 minutes okay so now what we have our problem is we don't know the half-life we know how long we've been doing it and we know the amounts okay so we can actually solve for half-life but that takes a rearrangement of the equation now if you're not very comfortable with logs and rearranging exponential equations that can be a problem here, okay? So I'm not going to have to teach you logs. I'm not going to go through that process. What I'm going to do is give you a separate equation that's already done the algebra for you, okay? So if you're not comfortable rearranging logarithmic equations, we're dealing with this um, natural log of this, act of this decay. So rearranging, what you see is that your half-life is equal to the time elapsed times the natural log of 2 divided by the natural log of how much you started with over how much you ended with, okay? Uh, in this equation, again, because we've got the A sub O and the A together now in a natural log, we can really easily rearrange this equation using simple uh, algebra to solve for little t or big t, okay? So in this equation, sorry, in this equation, we want to use that to solve for um, amounts, okay? If you're trying to solve for times, it's better to use this equation, okay? They're the same equation. It's the same math. All I've done is the algebra for you to get between one to the other because I'm not sure that everyone here is comfortable dealing with logs and the algebra with that. If you are comfortable with it, don't worry about it. Use the one equation and rearrange as you need to to do these problems, okay? So let's plug this into our problem and let's see what we have. So we were given um, 500 grams turning into 16.63 grams, okay? So our A sub 0 is the 500 grams. 
the 16.63 grams is how much uh, we have left over. Our time is 600 seconds that we've gone under, so that's the little t. And the 0.693, that's actually the natural log of 2. Okay, So I just took the natural log of 2 and typed it in and found it was 0.693. Okay? Uh, so big T would be 600 times 0.693 divided by the natural log of 500 over 16.63, and we get 122.2 seconds. Okay, So those are a couple examples of the calculations for half-life. Right? What we're going to do in class, we're going to start with these three. And these take it up a little bit of a notch in terms of the, their complexity because they deal with percentages and some other stuff in them. So we're going to start with these in class, work them out, and then the time that we have left after going through these three, uh, we're going to work on the second part of our worksheet, worksheet number two, which deals with all sorts of half-life equations. Okay, guys? That's video segment two. Thank you.